This week, it's a great opportunity that we have to have numerous wonderful resources on our campus helping us think about justice and motivating us to causes of justice in the name of Christ. And one of those individuals is our speaker for this morning's chapel, Steve Haas. Steve is the Vice President and Chief Catalyst for World Vision. And I love that title because as I've gotten to know Steve over the last few years, he is indeed a Chief Catalyst. He's a gifted, dynamic spokesperson for World Vision's worldwide humanitarian work with a role that includes working with church leaders, contributing to strategic planning and on major issues for World Vision, and communicating about global issues that affect the poor. After graduating from the University of Kansas, uh, Steve spent time on the Thai border working with Cambodian and Vietnamese refugees, so he had firsthand on the ground experience. He went on to uh, earn a Master of Divinity at Fuller Theological Seminary. We will forgive you for that, Steve. You should have come east, but that's okay. Uh, he worked in churches for a number of years, and then for the past 15 years, he has worked with World Vision. I had the wonderful privilege of spending a week with Steve in Israel two years ago. Uh, Steve, as a catalyst, gathered together five seminary presidents, and we spent a week meeting with leaders, learning of the complexities in that region of the world, spending a lot of time on the West Bank. It was a marvelous seven days together, together and he was the person that really made it possible. He had the dream behind it, and uh, he enabled us to just have a wonderful seven days of rich learning and fellowship together. Steve was with us a year or so ago, speaking in chapel. Steve, it's great to have you back. Welcome back to Gordon-Conwell. Well, it is a delight to be with you again. Uh, this is, we, let's just keep doing this, right? I mean, uh, if it's a good gig, as my kids say, just keep it going. So uh, really enjoyed being with you. I, uh, one of the things that has gone through my mind is images, and we're an image-rich nation. We're an image-rich world, and there's a lot of images out there, pictures that we carry with us, these uh, images that we have. We have them on smartphones. We have them on our computers. They move us. They motivate us. The kingdom of God, by the way, was full of them. Jesus, in trying to help us understand, used images in order to make sense of what was this new reality. Uh, this was, by the way, pre-electronic. This was pre-Facebook, Instagram. This was even before MySpace. These were the images Jesus used. Metaphor, allegory, parable. That's what he used to frame pictures in the mind's eye as to what life was really like in this brand new kingdom. And speaking of sustainability, this was going on for 2,000 years we've been using these stories, right? You're probably thinking of a sermon you're going to be preaching in homiletics, and you're going to use some of his images. Wheat and weeds, maybe this is one of my favorites. Wheat and weeds, Matthew 13, 24, agricultural image of weeds that are placed in the midst of wheat, serving as a little notion to us that we're not to serve as the final judge. The final judge is someone else, and we're to allow these things to grow up together. Sheep and goats. Do you remember this one? Matthew 25, 31, Jesus plays, who are you in the barnyard? All decided by how you react to the kinds of people that come across your path. Family photo, Matthew 12, 49, Jesus enlarges a family album. His mother comes in with some family members to rescue him from the crowds, and what does he say? Well, these are my brothers and my sisters, anyone who does the will of my father. I was so taken with this image, by the way, that when we were raising our kids as really little kids, little babies and growing up, toddlers, we just said that anyone who walks through the door of our house, if they're a follower of Jesus, will be an uncle or an aunt. Doesn't matter what country they're from. It wasn't until about the age of seven our son was saying, Uncle Henrik, is he really a part of our family? <laughs> yeah, we have the coolest, biggest family in the world. And it also helped us balance out the dysfunction that was already fully resident in our family's real bloodline. It's critical, it's critical that we begin to pay attention to these images as they give us direction as how to live our real faith, given the diverse environment in which you and I are actually called to live. Images. 
They have the power to see our memory. They have the power to make our conscience harden up on stuff, alter our direction, to react. And how we react, I actually believe how we react, actually determines the power of the image. Maybe it also determines the relevance of ours. One of my favorite images is what Jesus shared in Luke 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan. By the way, survey said, it's the most famous story Jesus ever told. Two religious leaders, you know it well, ignoring the man by the side of the road. And I quote, a Samaritan as he traveled, came to where the man was, and as he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you with the extra expense you may have. Story of a Jewish enemy, the face of Jewish clergy indifference, rescuing a fallen person lying by the side of the road. It just makes kind of an indelible impression on the people that are listening. My guess is if we had just changed some of the cultural nuances of that story, you'd be somewhat scandalized as well today. I mean, what do you do when you're confronted by the card-carrying, uh, disheveled guy on the freeway on-ramp? What about the person wounded by circumstances that would gall the conscience? What about the people that scare us? What about individuals that we disdain because of the clothes that they wear or the faith that they reverence? In telling the story to a person with Gloucester-level education, uh, Jesus makes a hero out of the last guy that you would ever imagine could actually show compassion. And of course, this wasn't new thinking. Jesus was just getting into the long line of thinking, this drumbeat of God-directed, compassionate response found throughout the Old Testament. It's all there. This move to compassion had precedence. He was actually walking in the line of faithful obedience, a common thread that God used that this is the way the people of God are supposed to move in terms of reconciliating the world to himself. How the people of Israel were to set themselves apart. I don't need, hold, we have a plenty of Old Testament scholars here, back me up on this. Deuteronomy 26, short time before the people enter the promised land, Moses gets instruction. What's the instruction? I want you to take the blessing you've been given and I want you to give that to the people around you, not just your own. I want you to do it for your neighbors. And if you don't do it, there's a little kicker here. I will cast you out of the land in the same way I cast the people out that were before you. Speaking of being special, in other biblical imagery, God fancies himself as a loving and protective owner of a vineyard. His, his creation is the fruit of the vine, beholding to him for nourishment and life. We have one job. It's to produce fruit for others to enjoy. We are not owners. We are not consumers. We are not fruit inspectors. In fact, he was really clear. Our job is fruitfulness. Otherwise, what are you doing? What are you here for? What's your purpose? Thank you, Rick Warren. What's your purpose in life? To be tied into him, the vine. You are the branches. The ancient church took this so seriously, so much, where they enveloped in this whole ideology of Acts 2, in which 3,000 were added in a single day when they actually practiced these principles that we actually have this by Rodney Stark. He actually captures this in his wonderful book, The Rise of Christianity, which I think is, should be required reading for anyone in the church. He states this, Dionysius, this is the quote of Dionysius, the bishop of Rome around 260 AD in tribute to the fallen faithful who had followed this devastating epidemic. This is what he says, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them, catch this, with them departed this life serenely happy, for they were infected. Now this isn't infected with joy. This, isn't, this is infected with the contagion that was killing people physically. Infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains, the best of our brothers lost their lives in this manner, the result of great piety and strong faith. Okay, you want strong faith? 
This may be the answer. The result of your strong faith. The result of great piety and strong faith seems in every way the equal of martyrdom. And then he puts this that is so rarely quoted. The heathen behaved in just the opposite way. At the first onset of the disease, they, they pushed the sufferers away and they fled from their dearest, throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treated unburied corpses as dirt, thereby hoping to avert the spreading contagion of the fatal disease. And this really became all important in the last 10 years when the church woke up to the issue of HIV and AIDS and suddenly realized there's a difference between a virus and a person. We love the person. We hate the virus. We should never collude them. Our actions lined up in this legacy of Christian history no longer ruled by fear. The church began to step up, motivated by their faith. Our actions created a frame for the world to see of what God was like, what God wanted, and who God really was. And people didn't miss the image. During those days of awakening of the faith community about the reality of the AIDS pandemic, what those of us on the inside of advocacy and engagement saw was there's a shift. There was just this massive shift toward this existential threat. And it's not over. Our actions help people understand what faith was by practical expression of what that faith was like in the, in the community, the at-risk community. Well, why do I say all this? Because I think significantly we're inside another critical global issue. The events of the last six months have only complicated our response. We're, it's challenged our thinking, but it's challenged our thinking in much the same way that age challenged our thinking some 14 years ago. This we know. Over the last four years, the Arab Spring, which showed so much promise, has turned into the Arab Deep Freeze with massive nations now playing out their aspirations in a much smaller region with obscene levels of weapons, obscene levels of violence, slavery, barbaric and bestial displays that, would, that literally would scar your conscience. People displacements at historic levels falling into an already largest people displacement in the history of the world, some 59 million. And the violence hasn't been contained to Syria either. This is playing out on the streets of Paris and Beirut, and even if you're in California, San Bernardino. The numbers as to who's been affected are staggering. Staggering. Over half the nation of Syria is outside their home because they can't live there. It's just too toxic. Seven to eight million people are internally displaced. They cannot get outside their own country. Some four and a half to five million, that's conservative, it's actually probably more like five to six million, have found living in Syria impossible. And so they're living in the collar countries of Lebanon and Jordan and Iraq and Turkey. I mean, look at these numbers. You can read. This is crazy. About six to seven hundred thousand have said even that's untenable. And so they've tried to get on leaky rubber dinghies and crowded those, sometimes three and four times the amount of capacity of those little ships, most of them don't know how to swim. Is it really that bad that you'd risk your family's life to go into dark water and you don't know how to swim at night? To put it into perspective, in four years, that would mean if this was happening to the United States, 173 million people will have vacated this country. I mean, I know big numbers because I also look at the national debt, but I mean, come on, friends. 173 million. And as a result, the Syrian refugee crisis represents the greatest migration of any group of people since World War II. And as to why Syria is in the state they're in, friends, your chapel's only 30 minutes. Can we just say that nearly five years of civil war have disemboweled this country to such an extent that people can't live there anymore? I think of Sela. Sela is who we met in a Palestinian, formerly Palestinian refugee camp in, in Beirut. Uh, you would know the name Shatila if you know the name of the Palestinian movement. Uh, and this lady now lives on the seventh story of a very rickety building because when you already have 12,000 on a postage stamp and you can't get any more land and 20,000 people in the last four years inundate that camp, you go up. So she's on the seventh story of this. She has no job. Her husband was killed evidently when she tried to escape 
there was a no fire time of 15 minutes. She turned to her husband and said, it's time for us to leave. They had already weathered bombardment. And they knew that sometime some missile was going to come in and take them out. So she grabbed her husband. She grabbed her two kids. They made a run for it. Unfortunately, someone didn't tell the snipers. And they took out her husband. And so she grabbed her two kids. While we were sitting there talking, there were two kids, a four and two-year-old. The two-year-old has his head on the four-year-old's lap, and the four-year-old, uncharacteristic for a four-year-old, is just stroking his head. Now, she already had two kids running around her. So I said, you only have two kids, but then who are these two? It's just kind of odd, awkward, that they're just sitting there. She goes, those are my kids. So how could they be your kids? You have two. You said you had two. She goes, oh, when we were leaving our town, those two kids were sitting by the side of the road. So when the war's over, what are you going to do with those kids? They're my kids. No job. A psychologist, a nurse practitioner, that's the educational level. And these are now my four kids. There's four million of them. Four million. And although the horrors of the conflict have, for the most part, been off our smart screens in early September, we saw another iconic image. It was the image of Ilan Kurdi. And this one just kind of broke through our comfort zone. It breached our ramparts of, of everything that we are, and we began to collectively wake up that maybe there's something going on. The iconic image, it's some, it somehow brands the human tragedy, doesn't it? it? It breaks through. I often speak on this crisis, and by the way, these numbers just sometimes begin to create almost isolation zones. We, we don't know what to do with something that's so large, so overwhelming. I mean, isn't this something that if you're attached to the US military, you should do something about? Um, we can't tap into the UN budget. Uh, where's Bill and Melinda Gates when you actually need them? You know, All sorts of good reasons for just to simply take a pass. I got other things to do. But then you, but then you begin to remember that image that Jesus gave about that guy in the ditch. And I don't want to play a hermeneutical homiletics game with you. Now, is that a guy that's directly in front of us? Um, how far, what's the approximation of the guy in the ditch? Is it, if, is, it on the, is it a trail and then we have to? What if it's a four-lane highway? Can I take a pass then? What if he's on the other side of the world? What if he's Syrian? I only pick up people in the ditches that are non-Muslim. We used to have an axiom that we would have at Willow Creek where I worked. It was a pretty large church. And just to kind of remember, help us focus. Numbers have faces, the faces have names. The names are really precious to the Father and if they're precious to the Father, then shouldn't they be precious to you and I? The numbers have faces and the faces have names. The names are really precious to the Father and if they're precious to the Father, shouldn't they be precious to you and I? Across the country, I'm speaking of a a generational test each of us are being called to take. And in the time remaining, I'd like to just give you four things that I think maybe it will help us just to remember, maybe what do we do with this? How do we react in the face of this? The first one would be simply just this, pray up, pray up. You can't underestimate the importance of prayer in this particular battle. It's, it's really easy to just see all this incredible human toll and think of everything just in physical terms. But if you do that, certainly as a Jesus follower, you have missed it. All the faith leaders we're talking to, both Christian and Muslim, are telling me, pray for us. Can you pray for us? That there's a spiritual battle being waged. Do we pray as the Apostle Paul prayed to the church at Thessalonica, in which he said that the word of the Lord would spread rapidly and that he would receive glory? He prayed for the church that it would be rescued from perverse and evil men. Very practical realities. Can we pray for peace in Syria? Have you ever prayed that? If you haven't prayed that, then what are you doing? I mean, seriously, greatest refugee crisis in the history of the world. Are you even praying for Syria? Does it even register on your radar screen? It didn't on mine. 
for three years. It didn't on mine, and I worked for World Vision. I talked with this Lebanese pastor, George. His church ministers to 1,500 refugees. They only have 120 people in the church. Do the math. He was quick to remind all of us who were listening, and all he did is quote Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle, he said, is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Do you pray for the Middle East church? Do you do that? Just a challenge this morning. I don't mean to guilt or shame anybody. I'd be the first one in line to say, I am the least uh, able to do this. But I can at least pray. We can make a decision to have a radical shift in our thinking that we're going to open our eyes that the Syrian people are victims, not perpetrators. Victims. As objects of God's grace than those that we turn our backs on. World Vision has put a great deal of emphasis on prayer. Do you pray for the Middle East specifically? As a child-focused agency, we're praying for kids. They're half of the refugees that are coming across the border. Kids. We put in a thing called child-friendly spaces where kids get psychosocial help, where they can begin to rebuild their very, very broken lives. Five and six years old. I was just sitting with a group of five and six years old. I was, I was sharing this yesterday. And... We often will ask them to do kind of fun stuff so that they can begin to unpack what it is they've experienced. I'm sitting with a line of kids, and, and they're just showing these pictures, right? Showing these pictures that they've drawn of what life was like in Syria. And the first one shows this little stick house and two cars and clouds. And that's clouds. I think, yeah, we can see that. Stick. There's my mom. There's my dad. There's my brother and sister. Next one. Next one. The third one, this kid goes, that's my house, sun, moon, and stars. Two cars. And I just thought, okay, we're going to, this is a whole line of kind of stick figure houses. You know, you just nod and smile and good job. Good. Five and six years old, cross-cultural, English into Arabic. You know, how far are we getting here, right? Good job, good job. So I just decided to speak up. That's a beautiful blue color, big blue color throughout the building. Beautiful blue color on your building. She goes, that's not blue color, that's an airplane. Now, on any other place that I would be sitting with kids, you just go real creative. Those five and six years old are really creative. She put an airplane in the middle of her house. And then the social worker, knowing I was confused, said, a barrel bomb took out her house. Dropped from a plane. Oh. And then the next picture was, and that's my house. And those, what look like pine cones, those are hand grenades. This is an image that the child is recalling from what he experienced. And he's five and six years old, and he doesn't know how to unpack that because that's the only knowledge he has of the world. Do you pray for them? Do we pray for the children caught in the conflict? Do we pray for the staff that works with them? What do we pray for? Do we take time to pray for these people? Do we intercede for the hearts of the international leaders? Do we intercede for the souls of the enemy? Or do we forget that the New Testament is largely a compendium of love letters to churches from a converted Christian killing terrorist? And God reached him. Do we pray for ISIS? And the leaders of that? That they would come to know the, the son of the living God? Do we think that's impossible? The most potent weapon that is typically the most neglected is prayer. Do we do that? Do we pray? Pray up. The second thing I would say is to wise up. In 1993, the Washington Post reporter Michael Weisskopf dismissed Christian evangelicals with this phrase, largely poor, uneducated, and easy to command. Uh, by the way, that is my tribe he's talking about. And as an insider, I was fairly irritated, uh, thinking I resemble that remark. Um, except the, I especially the easy to command statement. Um, as you might expect, a, co a correction came the next day in the Washington Post that says there is no factual basis for this statement. Yet it's from my tribe that I hear some of the most unkind remarks when it comes to Iraqi and Syrian refugees. And often those who have spent scant time with, uh, with these people. Uh, do you see People who bear God's image, or do we just see one big religious label that lambasts some 1.2 billion people? I heard one pastor recently corral all Muslims with the words demon religion. 
Do you know a Muslim? You ever been to a mosque? Ever taken a basic tour of the Quran? Did you know that there are 99 names for God and there's not one of those names that you as a follower of Jesus would have an objection to? This isn't to say that we agree with the means of salvation, a relationship with God. It doesn't mean that, that they and I agree on what Jesus did on the cross or what our future hope is. But there's plenty of stuff there to begin a very meaningful relationship if we will make the move. By the way, did you know that Muslims are by far the greatest victims of global tragedy? Like some 70 to 80 percent? Did you know that disproportionately the greatest number of refugees in our world share this particular faith? That they're desperately in need of God's love and compassion and that, frankly, when they become a refugee, they're just open for friendship. Which, from my experience, we're the best ones at doing it. The size of the situation is critical, and our organization is motivated by our faith. World Vision reaches out to Christian churches, organizations, governments, even Islamic charitable organizations and mosques, and this is creating no, converse, no small conversation amongst many other organizations around us. By the way, this is Sheikh Mohammed. I'll show you a picture of him. We're partnering with him because in his town of Seda, of which he is the kind of the unofficial mayor of Seda, he's the Sunni judge. Uh, with his help, we're actually able to dispense relief aid to many of the Syrian children who are not educated. 20% of Syrian children coming across the border into Lebanon do not get educated. Now, you do the math there if you want to talk about radicalization. In about 10 years, what happens if they don't get educated now? And oh, by the way, the system in Lebanon is French. The system in Syria is Arabic. Anyone have an Apple phone? Try to mix it with a Dell computer. Okay, we got, we're speaking the same language now. So you've got an educational problem. Sheikh Mohammed wants to solve it, but he needs help. So he's called on a Christian organization to come alongside him. And oh, by the way, Sheikh Mohammed's coming to the United States for the second time in two and a half months. The first one was for the National Prayer Breakfast. The second one is he's going to be on the stage with me at Q. And guess what we're going to talk about? Syria and Jesus. He loves talking about Jesus. Are we making an attempt to move beyond the news, to get underneath the news, to understand the news? Or are we just looking at one channel and getting all of our feedback from presidential candidates? Are we taking a deeper dive into a selected country and informing ourselves as to what it means to be a citizen of the world, a Jesus citizen of the world? We need to pray up. We need to wise up. And if you become more attuned to those who define this crisis, don't be surprised if you begin to speak up, to be a voice for those who don't have one. And at present, there is a dialogue in our land as to how to treat the foreigner, the stranger. And for you and I, thankfully, that subject was settled a long time ago. God settled it. Our leader, Jesus, lived it. As to the foreigner, we're to be their advocate. We're to care for them. These are God's orders. Don't kill the messenger. God's orders. And let me be clear, I'm fairly certain that if public surveys are accurate, there are some people even here who might even say, oh, ooh, man, you're just really chafing at the bit, pal. I mean, you're really backing up to the line. You're kind of on the outer edge here. I mean, I think governments are good things. They have a role to play. They are to manage public safety. We're to exercise our voice in our nation's democratic process with gratitude for the opportunity to exercise such freedom. And that freedom is to be honored and it's to be protected. But that in no way absolves us from doing what God called you and I to do. And so then I have to ask, what's holding us back? We did a series of surveys. One of them was with the Barna Corporation. We had done one with HIV many years ago, which was quite telling. And we found out that many pastors of churches feel that, in the 70 to 80 percent range, feel that people should be involved on the Syrian crisis. But then when we ask, have you ever said anything from the pulpit about the Syrian crisis, the numbers were under 10 percent. Fear, I think, is what's called. Fear that somehow faith needs to regain control. I was just looking through the scriptures. These were easy to find. You don't really need a concordance for this. Psalms 27.1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 
if you missed it the first time, Psalm 56, 3. When I am afraid, I trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mortal men do to me? And then if you kind of miss that and decide, well, that's kind of the Psalms, and David was a little bit off sometimes, then you move into Isaiah 41, 13, and you have, for I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. And then in case you just think it's kind of an Old Testament thing, then you find Jesus, Jesus in Matthew's gospel. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What was that quote from church history? Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need, ministering to them in Christ. One thing we talked about yesterday, fear has a tough time rattling somebody when they're already dead. And you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Our staff has already touched the lives of some 2.3 million Syrian refugees in very practical ways because it's got to get practical. And I'd maybe like to just close with the last one. Act up. Act up. Someone once described the church as the only organization in the world that exists for the benefit of the non-member. I think that's a pretty good description. We're a body of doers. That's what we are. A safety net for the fragile Arab community in these places is fraying and falling. The UN, which used to be $31 for a registered refugee, is now down to about nine. In the next three months, it is believed that if money doesn't come in from other foreign governments, there will be no money left for food for refugees. And when you can't get a job, where does that food come from? Nations like Lebanon, that's four million persons taking care of an additional 1.6 to 1.7 new immigrants in four years. You do the math. How do you do that? It'd be like 85 million Canadians coming across the border in just four years. And we freaked out when we found out a thousand El Salvadoran kids were going to come across, all teens. What do you do with that? Well, we've tried to step into the gap, and we need to say this. The church is our partner. You're our partner in this. Our indispensable partner is the local church. Not every church is willing to engage, and so we just go to work regardless. Uh, this has meant food distribution, clothing, shelter, uh, teaching on marriage, because there's a lot of hitting going on right now in all communities because of the frustration in the marriage. Parenthetic comment, by the way, Galatians 6.10, Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I meet so many believers for which that's a really key Verse And they go, you know what that says? That's saying that we should first go to the church. We should go to the believers first. Let's get to those believers. I mean, that just makes sense. We should provide for those who share our faith first, maybe only. We're going to draw a circle as to who the church is. We're going to start there. Every time I see this happen, I watch what God does. He then draws a bigger circle. He keeps drawing bigger circles. What was the verse? Let us do good to all people. All. World Vision's budget last year alone was $120 million for the caller countries, and it was dwarfed by the need. Dwarfed. Clean water systems, informal tent settlements, waste treatment, because you've got to do something with the waste, clothing, shelter, systematic distribution of hundreds of thousands of food vouchers, insulation parcels, tent construction, hygiene training, personal care products. Why? Because you've got these millions of people that are in need. And you've got to do something. You can't just sit there. You've got to pray. You've got to do. Acting up means that understanding the future generations of Middle East leaders are presently growing up inside a tent, and they're freezing. And if you care about this region, and if you care about your world, if you care about radicalized citizens, you don't make a plan for 10 years from now. You make a plan now so that you have a plan 10 years from now. What are we doing now? Because it's now that we have to do something. And why do we do this? I'll just close with this. There was another image. The Apostle Paul was taken with this image. It was an image that moved him past his insecurities, 
past, his sense of fear. It was this image that's, that he talks about in Colossians 1. For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. And then here comes this image. This image that absolutely has taken over his mind and heart to such an extent that he will go and do anything at any time at the quick prompting of, of the Holy Spirit to move him into action. The Son is the image of the invisible God. And that motivates him, that moves him to action. So that he's praying up. So that he's wising up. So that he's speaking up. But so that he's showing the world the true image of that invisible God by acting up. I don't beg often, but if you're connected to a church today and you're not in some way involved here, what are you doing? We've been praying for Muslims. We've been praying for the Middle East. We've been praying for peace. And now all these people are coming at us. I'm not saying God created this, but I've never found an opportunity like this in which God isn't screaming, I can use this to show the world my love. And guess who his plan A is, and there ain't no plan B. It's you. It's me. Come join us. We need your help. Father, thank you for the opportunity to share this morning for uh, a crazy issue that has us running really hard. All of us. We've prayed for people who don't know you. And then a disaster happens and people are wide open to just be shown love, to have a friend. And in doing so, countless numbers of people are discovering you. Help us not to miss this assignment. Help us to be faithful to the prompting that you give us. And in all these things, Father, may you receive the honor and the glory that you so richly deserve. In your name we pray. Amen. Stand together for a short final prayer and the benediction. Oh God, we sense that you have sent your messenger to us this morning. And we pray that your hand would continue to be upon your servant, prophetically, Steve, and upon the ministry of World Vision. And God, search our hearts, uh, trouble our souls. And show us, Lord, what you would have us to do. What are individual first steps, real steps, no matter how small, by which you want us to respond to what we've heard. Lord, we cry out for the nation of Syria, for the flood of refugees. We pray for the governments of Turkey. Greece, Croatia, France, Germany, the UK, the United States. Lord, move in the hearts of these government leaders, these people in authority who have political and economic power. Lord, we pray for not only open hearts, but open gates. And as we think of our own nation, and our own government leaders in this electoral process. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we would speak against all spirits of Islamophobia and xenophobia, negative feelings about the other. Lord, we would even pray for a spirit of humility as American citizens, from the White House to our house, and Lord, we would repent of any responsibility that we bear for the well-intended but mistaken foreign policies of the United States of America that has contributed to this refugee crisis and created so much devastation 
loss of life and property in the Middle East. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. And now, Lord, speak your good words into our hearts. And now may the love and the affection of God, our Heavenly Father, and the favor and the friendship of Jesus Christ, God's beloved Son, and the wisdom and the compassion of God the Holy Spirit rest not only upon us, but upon those who are far needier than we, for whom we pray. Lord, have mercy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.